come, Holy Spirit. Come, let our hearts be faithful, and rekindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and ye shall be created, and ye shall renew the face of the earth. O God, by the light of the Holy Spirit, did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in our consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we're running, you know, this is going to be a quick seminar this morning. And um, I just want to welcome all of you here for the this seminar. Like Father said, the first of its kind, and we're looking forward to do more and more in-depth seminar. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit is looking for people who are hungry for him, especially in this day and age. You know, we sometimes wonder why it lay dormant, or actually the dormant, but underground, the movement of the Holy Spirit. But in this day and age, God needs us. He's stirring us up, right? He's stirring us up. He needs us. And so this seminar is on the gift of tongues, and mainly because it's one of the most controversial and misunderstood gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? It's the one that has the most questions and the how-tos, and there's so much, sometimes people said it's dead, the church doesn't need it, it was only for the beginning of the church, and so there's a lot of mishmash on it, so that's why we wanted to, to start this today. So this will not be an in-depth uh, teaching on the gift of tongues, but it's going to be focusing on actually, um, as some of the charisms of the Holy Spirit, the one that's most controversial, and hopefully we'll have some insight in, into it. But in our day and time, we began to see the gift of tongues in, uh, in the Catholic Church in the mid-60s. The 67 is actually being the date that they said this was the date, you know, that they're, um, they're quoting as the beginning. And, um, and actually, we see that it's an overflow of the Holy Father, Pope John XXIII's call for Vatican Council II, and he said, renew, he said this prayer to the Holy Spirit, Renew your wonders in our day as a new Pentecost in exactly what's happened. The Holy Spirit fell on millions and millions of Catholics, and to this day, millions of Catholics have experienced this with their own Pentecost. And it's caused a great renewal in the church. Many of the, the people that first experienced that back in the 60s, 70s, 80s are still active in the church ministries. Many do Bible studies, evangelizations, uh, works of mercy, corporal works of mercy, spiritual works of mercy. It's just caused a great groundswelling of the move of the Holy Spirit in our time. And just, we need it, right? Amen? Amen? We need it. So what we want to do before Deacon Dave talks is we're going to give a short introductory to what happened back there in the 60s that caused this renewal and revival of that's happening in the church today. So just be patient. Look that way, and uh, we'll get that going for you. After his death and resurrection, when it was time for Jesus to ascend to heaven, he told his followers to wait for the promise of the Father. With the coming of the Holy Spirit, the lives of individuals were changed. The community itself was transformed. The church was born. The beginning of the Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII led the church in praying for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Renew your wonders in this our day, as by a new Pentecost. A few years later, seemingly as a result of John XXIII's prayer for renewal, a significant event took place that would forever change the lives of millions of Catholics and the Church itself. On a weekend retreat, these Catholic students prayed that, in some way, they too might discover a renewed sense of Pentecost in their lives. That prayer to prayer, complete surrender to the Father, saying, Father, I place my life in your hands, and I desire to follow Jesus, your Son, whatever that means. It means to suffer, I accept that. Only teach me the love of His love. As I prayed that prayer in kneeling, I found myself in the next few moments prostrate, overwhelmed with the sense of God's personal love for me. In the next hour, God sovereignly me through all the students at that retreat house, up into the chapel where we knelt before Jesus. They prayed the Veni Creator Spiritus, the very same hymn sung by Pope Leo XIII on January 1st, 1901, asking for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the whole church. Other students, and even their teachers, began to join them, praying that they too might experience this fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And they did. 
The charismatic renewal continued to spread at an amazing rate throughout the world. Those who prayed for the experience that came to be known as baptism in the Spirit had experiences similar to all the others. A new depth of prayer, love for the scriptures, a devotion to the Eucharist, a heart for evangelization, a call to conversion, and a life of holiness. Many vocations to the priesthood, diaconate, and religious life concerned for the needy. The formation of deeper relationships and even lay communities. Experiencing various spiritual gifts or charisms healing, music, the, Holy Spirit be God. this charismatic renewal has indeed been a source of personal renewal for individuals and an impetus for renewal within the church itself. I began to experience a tremendous joy in my priesthood. I began to have a great compassion for people. I discovered through the charismatic renewal, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, something deeper than that which I would had previously. And that deeper thing was a new relationship with Jesus Christ. That changed my life. He is very much alive in us. And he wants to talk to us. And he wants to communicate with us. And not only that, he gave us so many gifts through the Holy Spirit. And therefore, he is asking us to use these gifts. And to use these gifts to be like him to continue his work. Now, once you know who you are, therefore you can talk about it with passion. You talk about it with enthusiasm, which literally means enteu, which means to be in God. What was happening among Catholics that got the attention of Cardinal Leon Joseph Sunnins, a key architect of the Second Vatican Council. On Pentecost Sunday in 1975, Cardinal Sunins and 10,000 individuals who had this charismatic experience met with Pope Paul VI. We are pleased to see signs of this renewal. It is a day of joy, but also a day of resolve and determination to open ourselves to the Holy Spirit and to proclaim Christian authenticity that Jesus is love. as a living and present reality in their daily lives. 
I desire that the spirituality of Pentecost be spread in the church. International Catholic Charismatic Renewal Services. ECRIS was approved by the Holy See as a private association of the faithful with a juridical personality. It operates under the direction of the Pontifical Council for the Lady. Its purpose is threefold. Promote the central goals of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal all over the world. Promote unity among the varied realities and expressions of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. As establish dialogue and cordial relationships with other ecclesial movements and communities within the Catholic Church and with other ecclesial communions and Christian churches. In 1998, ECRIS, with other lay movements, helped the Pontifical Council for the Laity organize an international gathering of lay movements. Over 300,000 people gathered. Today, I would like to cry out to all of you gathered here in St. Peter's Square and to all Christians, open yourselves docilely to the gifts of the Spirit. Accept gratefully and obediently the charisms which the Spirit never ceases to bestow on us. Do not forget that every charism is given for the common good, that is, for the benefit of the whole Church. Il secolo trascorso, costellato da tristi pagine, though the past century was marked by some of the saddest pages of history, it was at the same time studied with wonderful testimonies of spiritual and charismatic revival in all areas of human life and activity. It is my firm hope that the Holy Spirit will find more and more fruitful welcome in the hearts of believers so that the culture of Pentecost, so necessary in our time, can spread. Since 1967, over 120 million Catholics in over 220 countries in the world have experienced this refreshment of the Holy Spirit. That's a different one than I was going to show. That's seven minutes long, so we don't have time for that. <laughs> Julie, you know how to turn that off? Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, so, um, since we've had such a wonderful introduction, what I want to do is just, like I said, introduce you to the gift of praying in tongues and singing in tongues and what that means, answer some of your questions. We, get, we pass out little pieces of paper for you to write your questions. We'll look at those towards the end. If they haven't already been answered in the seminar, we'll be able to address them. So right now, what I'd like to do is just bring Deacon David up. He's going to share with us. You know, he's, been, he's a deacon, and he's been um, at St. Francis Church since 2012. He's married, he's five children, eight grandchildren like I do, and then also one great-grandchild. Um, he is a uh, part of the marriage preparation ministry team. He makes weekly visits to the sick and homebound, conducts faith sharing groups with the incarcerated Indio Jail, which is, I don't know now where you have time for all this. But he's also <laughs> spiritual advisor for the Knights of Columbus Council 13203 and for the Life and the Spirit Seminar here at uh, Sacred Heart. So with that, I'd like to introduce Deacon Collier Ford. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing? Good. Good. I'm glad to see that we're God's chosen people, not God's frozen people. <laughs> <laughs> and this is really the thing. I'm, you know, I'm looking at this video, and every I've seen this many, many times before, and every time I see it, I get goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah. Because the movement of the Spirit yeah. is just palpable. You cannot be in the presence of the power and not be moved. You just cannot be. So what I'd like to do this morning is begin by sharing with you my journey on receiving the gift of tongues. At the turn of the century, <laughs> and you all remember the turn of the century, right? 
The year 2000? When all the computers were going to crash and the world was going to come to an end? Well, we're still here. Anyway, I experienced a, a dryness of, of prayer during that time. And, and I became quite restless. If any of you have had a dryness in your prayer life, you know that feeling. It just, it just not settled. And so um, I saw an article in the newspaper about something called century prayer. And it, it piqued my interest. So I sought out a century prayer group. I found a very good, good group. And it really helped that dryness that I was experiencing. And I remained in that group until I moved to the desert in 2003. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find a century prayer group. And I know you have one here. But I didn't know about this when I first came to town. So um, I was continuing the century prayer practice on my own. And one day, I noticed a, a flyer for a Life in the Spirit seminar. Okay, I thought, this may be a good substitute for my century prayer group. So I attended a, a, a seminar. And at that seminar, I was deeply moved by the Holy Spirit. And it seems that that is where the Spirit was leading me all along. So it was a step-by-step -step process. And toward the end of the day, long gathering, the team leaders prayed over each of us for a baptism of the Spirit, after which they encouraged us to pray in tongues. Tongues? <laughs> I had barely heard of tongues before this day, much less had an understanding of them. As the leaders and the participants began praying in what sounded to me like a real cacophony, I tried to join in. But it just wasn't happening. I felt ridiculous, you know. So, God is patient, and God is kind. Yes. He didn't strike me dead. <laughs> Instead, he waited, and he waited, and he waited. And as I mentioned, I was deeply moved by the Spirit, and I attended several more Life in the Spirit seminars, even gave my personal testimony at one of them. And then one day I was invited to join the core team of the Life in the Spirit. Still, no tongues. About a year later, I was driving by myself thinking about a talk that I was going to give at an upcoming seminar. And without realizing at, at first, I began to babble. Like a baby. <laughs> driving down the road. Well, I had received the gift of tongues in my car, driving down Fred Waring. God is patient. He also has a sense of humor. So that brings me to my first point, which is that tongues is a gift. You know, Father uh, Monsignor Lincoln was mentioning this in his opening remarks. It is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing that we can do to earn it, and we can't deliberately set out to learn it. What we must do, however, is to be open to receiving his gift. And up to this time, I had not been ready to receive the gift. Okay? My work on the core team of Life in the Spirit had prepared me over a period of time. And now the time was right. It was God's time, not my time. Okay? But I tell you, I certainly wasn't ready to step out in public with this new gift. It still felt very awkward, and I was very, very self-conscious about it. But something was different this time than when I had first encountered the gift of tongues. I found myself drawn to the experience. Instead of being off-put by it, I found it to be attractive. You see, the Holy Spirit doesn't give us a gift that we don't like. He's not going to say, well, fix him, I'll give him this gift. He won't like it at all. No, it doesn't work that way. 
And it might take us a while to get used to it. The gifts he gives are perfect, but we're not. So my attractions to the tongues was, I believe, a sign from the Holy Spirit of his desire that I have this gift. Well, what good is a gift if you don't use it? So I practice in private when nobody could hear me. <laughs> like when at home or driving in my car by myself. And I vowed not to shy away from tongues, no matter what it sounded like to my ear, no matter how ridiculous I felt doing it. And after a couple of months, I became more comfortable and confident in this gift. I went to charismatic prayer meetings, and I actively prayed in tongues with others who also had the gift. And I must tell you today, I treasure this gift, and I use it in my diaconal ministry. So what is the gift of tongues? At its core, tongues is a form of prayer, expressed verbally or in song. And as we know, there are different kinds of prayer. There's intercessory prayer. There's prayer of praise. There's prayer of petition, to name a few. We're very familiar with the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be. We understand the words to these prayers. Praying in tongues, on the other hand, involves a language of what we call non-rational prayer. That is, we don't understand the words. Instead, we surrender our voice our capacity to speak, our inner self, and our thoughts to the Spirit. And among the difficulties we encounter with tongues at the beginning is precisely these two aspects. The non-rational, that is, the nonsensical aspect of it to us, and the surrender. It's hard to let go, especially when it comes to speech, because we're so used to talking every day in our speech we understand it, we control it, you know. And, and it, so it's hard to just surrender that and let the Holy Spirit take over that faculty within us. And I speak from personal experience. I think this, these are the things that hung me up for the better part of a year. St. Paul addressed this very point in Romans. Chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. The Spirit comes to the aid of our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit itself intercedes with inexpressible groanings. And the one who searches hearts knows what is the intention of the Spirit, because it intercedes for the Holy Ones according to God's will. Inexpressible groanings. Tongues. Non-rational prayer of the Spirit. How often have we run across a situation when we needed to pray, but we couldn't quite find the right words. We might say in Our Father or Hail Mary, but still had the feeling that we hadn't prayerfully addressed the heart of the situation we were praying about. And I've experienced this on more than one occasion. And the answer is pray in tongues. Let the Spirit intercede for us. And the one who searches hearts God knows what is the intention of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for us according to God's will. So in tongues it becomes not us, but the Spirit who is praying through us because we have surrendered ourselves to the action of the Spirit. <coughs> Prayer is conversation with God, which means both speaking and listening. And so it is with tongues. Traditionally, there are two modes or usages of tongues. To pray in tongues, whether it be verbally or in song, we are speaking to God. And speaking in tongues, God is speaking to us. So in the first case, the action is upward. We are praying to God. In the second case, the action is downward. God is speaking to us. Now, my remarks so far have focused on praying in tongues. And once we receive this gift, we can exercise it at will. It doesn't require interpretation, and it can be used either privately or in a prayer group setting. 
On the other hand, speaking in tongues is a community affair, and it takes place in a group setting. The Holy Spirit prompts an individual to give a message aloud in tongues during the charismatic prayer service. And this is followed by interpretation. And here is St. Paul's instruction to the Corinthians. If anyone speaks in tongue, let it be two, or at most three, and each in turn, and one should interpret. But if there is no interpreter, the person should keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Notice that Paul emphasizes an orderly service, each in turn. Notice, too, that he requires the presence of someone who has the gift of interpretation of tongues. A person who has this gift is able to listen to what is spoken in tongues and then speak to the group in their vernacular language, the message of what has just been uttered. It's not a word-for-word -word translation of the tongue, but it is an interpretation of the message that is coming through the person who is speaking in tongues. So simply put, praying in tongues is our speaking to God in the language of the Spirit. Speaking in tongues is God speaking to us in the language of the Spirit. In either case, it is always the language of the Spirit. Which brings up the question, is tongues a language? A dog goes for a job interview with the application of his mouth, and the startled interviewer tests him for the required typing skills. The dog passed with flying colors. Then the interviewer tells the dog, you need to be good with the computer, too. So the dog goes to the computer and types out a spreadsheet. The flabbergasted interviewer says, there's one more requirement. You have to be able to speak a second language. <laughs> the dog looks at the interviewer and goes, Meow. <laughs> <laughs> there are approximately 5,000 known languages in the world. With the gift of tongues, the Holy Spirit uses our natural ability to speak as a means of glorifying God. The person uttering in tongues has no knowledge of the language being spoken and instead raises his or her mind to God. It's analogous to when we say the rosary. When we say the rosary, we focus on the mysteries of the rosary. And if we're focused on those mysteries, the individual prayers, the Our Father, the Hail Marys, the Glory Bees, sort of move to the background. We're saying them. We know we're saying them. But our mind is focused on the mystery. And so it is with tongues. We surrender our faculties to the Spirit. So our mind is focusing on the Spirit where the Spirit is leading us in prayer, and the actual sounds that are coming out of our mouth are secondary. They're into the background of that. That's what happens in tongues, whether you're praying in tongues or speaking in tongues. And I will say, let me make it very clear, speaking in tongues is not for everyone. It's not a gift that's given to everyone. But praying in tongues, Anybody can have this gift. The Spirit wants all of us to have this gift. Okay? Because it's a gift that builds up our holiness, and as we're using it and we're praying in tongues, that others see that and it builds up their holiness as well. The Spirit tailors the gift of tongues to each individual. To some, he can give several languages, and they can switch back and forth seamlessly. To others, he gives only one language. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And this is why it's wise not to compare one person's gift to another person's gift. The way I pray in tongues is not the way you pray in tongues. It's not the way you pray in tongues. It's tailored to each one of us by the Spirit. Okay? Now, there are four levels of maturity 
in the gift of tongues. The first level is called the paralinguistic level. This is, if you will, the beginner level, the lowest form of tongues. It's the one I talked about a few minutes ago. <coughs> the sounds uttered are simply repetitive babble, like baby talk. <laughs> you know, those of you who have grandkids, little grandkids running around, you know what that sounds like. <laughs> the second level is the linguistic level. So the, what happens at the second level is that the utterances take on diction, articulation, cadence, variety, fluency, and non-repetitiveness. And these are the hallmarks of a language, collectively known as syntax. If you'll think back to your days in grade school, syntax and diagramming sentences and the structure of all of this stuff. Is that my phone? <laughs> it sounds like it's coming from back over there. Let me just yeah. see. I turned this thing off. <coughs> no. Our phones are singing. <laughs> oh, it's I put this thing on privacy. Oh, it's right there. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> all right. Oh, I like this ignore button. <laughs> My apologies. I thought I had turned this thing off. Okay. Where was I? Okay, we were talking about the linguistic level and syntax. Um, the University of Michigan Linguistics Department conducted an experiment with a group of charismatics who had just received the gift of tongues. And the experiment was to record their utterances in a computer over a period of time. The computer was programmed to recognize syntax, the structure of language. And what they discovered was that at the beginning, there was no structure. Level one, baby talk, babble, okay? But after some weeks, the computer began to recognize syntax as the charismatics moved into level two. It could not translate the language, 5,000 known languages, you couldn't program the thing to, to translate that. But it could recognize that structure, that diction, articulation, cadence, etc. The signs of a structured of a structured language. Okay. This is a normal progression in receiving the gift of tongues. And this was my experience because as I would practice praying in tongues over time, and usually about four to eight weeks is the period of time that, that this covers you will find that your tongues, your prayer in tongues, begins to sound more structured, okay? There's one thing you need to be aware of, and that is that the evil one wants to derail any movement that we might make toward God. And one of the ways that he does it is to make us feel foolish. This is ridiculous. I'm not going to do this. I give up. Forget it. He's delighted when we do that. So, when you first start out praying in tongues, welcome it as a gift. Know that you've got to go through, just like we do in natural life, we've got to go through the baby stage. But then in time, it will, if you keep up with it, it will take on structure. And if we are to receive the gift of tongues, we have to take action. First, we have to ask for it. The Holy Spirit will never force a gift on us. Here, take this. We need to ask for it. Okay? And He is most generous in giving. And then, we got to open our mouths. we got to babble. If we just sit there with our mouths clamped shut, we will never pray in tongues. Human action has to work with divine action. Okay? And we also need to have a sense of where we are in the progression of it. As I said, four to eight weeks, it begins to take on this structure. And this assumes that we pray in tongues regularly, at least once a day for a few minutes, to keep it, keep it up and to get comfortable with it and practice it. 
we have a sense um, of when our tongues take on uh, the syntax of language. So we don't want to get stuck at level one and never go beyond the babbling stage. All right, we begin as charismatic babies, learning to speak the language of the spirit and maturing into it over time. The third level, and I want to mention these, these two levels here that are, are much less common. The third level is the jubilous level. A jubilee is a, a celebration that describes what happens when a prayer meeting turns jubilous. The Holy Spirit saturates the room. It becomes filled with unbounded joy. And miraculous things happen. Cancers are cured. Marriages are restored. Blindness is healed. Paralytics get up and walk. Right then and there, in the meeting, the power of the Spirit is palpable. We saw some of that in the video of the Spirit moving through the crowd. Okay? This level is a rare occurrence. Some who have been in the charismatic movement for years have witnessed it only a handful of times, if that often. Okay? Many have never witnessed it. I have never witnessed it personally myself. I don't know if any of the other team members ever have or not. Donna has. Okay? But I want you to be aware that it does occur. Okay? The fourth level is called the mystic level. We all know mystics. Holy men and women who have this, this elevated relationship, this elevated prayer life with God. Tongues is one of the not the only, but it is one of the ways that we get to a mystic level. Those who start out in prayer or songs and, and tongues become overpowered by the Holy Spirit, literally forced to stop and fall into silence, and they're catapulted into a deep contemplative experience. Most of us will never experience or see this level, but I want you to be aware that it does happen it has happened, it exists, and it's out there. So most of us will be at level two, where we are praying in a structured format of tongues. Another use of tongues, besides praying and speaking, is called science. Simply put, it's when the gift of tongues results in a conversion experience for unbelievers. Now we're familiar with the account of the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles as told in Acts chapter 2. They're all in the upper room, doors and windows were locked, and the Holy Spirit descended upon them, and tongues of fires came. And Acts goes on to say, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues, as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven, staying in Jerusalem. At this sound, the noise from the sky, remember the noise that could, like a rushing wind that came in. They gathered, the, the crowd gathered, and they were confused because each one heard the apostles speaking in their own language. They were astounded. And then Peter goes on to give his famous sermon to the crowd. But each of them heard it in their own language. Fast forward to modern times. In San Francisco, a skeptical visitor wanders into a charismatic prayer meeting. He listens for a bit while they're all praying in tongues and becomes attracted by one of the persons there. He says, I know what you're saying. That's Ukrainian Russian. That's my native language. The person praying didn't know Ukrainian Russian at all. Seriously. That's, that was the gift language of the Spirit that he was praying in, but had no knowledge of it. Yet it was fluent, and this man understood it. This caused his skeptic conversion. Okay. There were a group of charismatics on a pilgrimage in Israel. A lady who was fluent in English and Portuguese was praying in tongues as the group traveled by bus from one destination to another. Their Jewish guide walked down the aisle, stopped to listen to her for a moment, and then asked her, do you know what language you're praying? She said, no, I only know English and Portuguese. The guide tells her, 
you're speaking a very rare dialect of Hebrew that is heard only in two little villages in Israel. And we're passing by one of them right now. She asked him if he'd like to convert, and he smiled and said, Jesus is my friend. <laughs> Who knows if he converted later or not. Okay? But he definitely was impressed by that. One more story quickly. In New Jersey, a Japanese woman who was Buddhist and married to a Catholic man. So figure that one. <laughs> she very reluctantly accompanied him to a charismatic prayer meeting one night. And she heard a person behind her speaking in Japanese, and she thought maybe it was a, a countryman that was conversing with her. So she turned around, and she, much to her surprise, found a middle-aged Anglo man praying in fluent Japanese. And as if that weren't enough, she was startled to hear this person utter her secret temple name, known only to her and to the monk who gave it to her in Osaka. She then heard in Japanese from this person praying personal things about her life and the Lord calling her. She converted. I know. It is unbelievable. The power of tongues. The power of tongues. These stories demonstrate that power. And remember, each case... The person praying in tongues had no idea of the language he or she was using. Faith is a gift from God. How we respond to faith determines our experience of God. We experience God through His work, or through His Word, when we listen attentively and reflect on its meaning in our present life. We experience God in the Eucharist, when we unite ourselves with His body, blood, soul, and divinity. We experience God when we pray. And when we pray in tongues, we move beyond human thought and analysis, beyond human linguistics, to surrender to the action of the Holy Spirit. Imagine receiving communion, returning to your pew, and softly praying in tongues, an experience of praising the divine presence within you through the language of the Holy Spirit. The gift of tongues opens the door to receiving other charisms. Now the word charism comes from the Greek meaning gift. To be charismatic means simply to be gifted. We use this term in our everyday lives, often in connection with the arts. A gifted painter, a gifted musician, you know, a gifted writer. And indeed, the Holy Spirit can and does use these human traits, elevating them to an even higher level for the purpose of sanctifying the body of Christ. Our church has always been charismatic. Jesus was the epitome of charismatic, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Notice he never claimed his gifts, the gifts of healing and teaching and prophecy and all the gifts, as coming from himself. Instead, he always pointed to the Father and to the Spirit as the source. The charismatic dimension runs throughout the New Testament. And here's what the Catechism has to say in part about charisms. Whether extraordinary or simple and humble, charisms are graces of the Holy Spirit which directly or indirectly benefit the Church, ordered as they are to her building up to the good of men and to the needs of the world. Charisms are to be accepted with gratitude by the person who receives them and by all members of the church as well. <clears throat> there are two types, if you recall from your catechism, there are two types of gifts of the Holy Spirit. The sanctifying gifts and the charismatic gifts. The sanctifying gifts we receive at baptism and strengthened at confirmation. They are intended for our personal holiness. So they focus inward. The charismatic gifts, on the other hand, focus outward. They're used to build up the church, the body of Christ, for the good of others and for the needs of the world. The image of charismatic as being emotionalism, fanaticism, disorder, rolling on the floor, shouting, jumping up and down, 
is just not accurate. Especially when it comes to praying in tongues. You see, God doesn't suddenly change our personalities when we receive a gift. All right? God created us the way we are. He respects our personalities. So, the way we are is the way we will exercise our gifts. Some of us are quiet, reserved, and some of us are very effusive, very demonstrative. And so, those are the qualities that will come forth when we are exercising our, our gift. The problem that Paul had with the Corinthians was that they were like getting off the charts with this. I mean, number one, they were getting drunk on the communion wine. And they had this mistaken notion that in order to, in order to be in union with and have the gift, you have to be like flying off the ceiling. And if you weren't flying off the ceiling, you didn't have it. And that's just not true at all. We all have the gift. And we'll express the gifts through our human personality. We saw from the videos today the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Program. It started in Pittsburgh in 1967. Quite an experience for those students. Very, very moving experience. Four popes, as we have seen, have endorsed the charismatic renewal. This is real. This is not something that is not Catholic. This is another objection that we hear about all the time. Well, this is just not part of the church. This isn't Catholic. It's very Catholic. Our church, is, as I said, has been charismatic from day one. Absolutely from day one. And Bishop Barnes, our bishop in this diocese of San Bernardino, is very supportive of charismatic renewal to the point where he established an office of charismatic renewal at the diocese to assist all of the parishes in this diocese in promoting and developing the charismatic renewal within their parish. And if you'd like more information on the Catholic charismatic renewal movement, Google it. There's a lot of information out there. Just the caveat is, as usual, when you're out on the internet, there's some good stuff, but there's some not so good stuff. So you have to be cognizant of that. But if you Google it, you're going, you can find out a lot, a lot more uh, information about it. About five years after the start of the Charismatic Renewal Movement, the Life in the Spirit seminars began. It, it was in about 1972 that they started. There's an outgrowth of the movement. Life in the Spirit seminars are designed to proclaim the basic message of Christianity so that those who hear it make a renewed commitment to the Lord, following them to allowing them to experience a fuller life in the Spirit. The seminar is not designed as a course of adult education, nor as a theological update on the charismatic renewal, but it is a tool of faith formation, and that was my experience with Life in the Spirit. It helps me in my faith journey, in my faith formation process, and strengthened it. And through uh, the activity of the life in the spirit, I believe came my call to the accurate. So I began this talk by telling you about my experience at Charismatic Renewal through the life in the spirit seminar and the impact it's had. So now I'd like our coordinator of Life in the Spirit seminars here at Sacred Heart, Donna Ostrander, to say a few more words about this important ministry. And I thank you for your attention. Um, we gave everybody handouts. If you don't have any, uh, please raise your hand and we can get them to you. I just want to follow up with um, Deacon David's um, talking about the Life in the Spirit seminars. And we do want to let you know about an upcoming one. It's Saturday, June 29th. It will be over in McNellis Hall. And uh, Deacon Steve Greco is coming for the day. I don't know how many here know Deacon Steve Greco. Um, Deacon uh, Dave has, has worked with him. Um, they both have spoken at Magnificat. They're both um, 
God is using in a powerful way with, as instruments of healing. And uh, so with that, we're just encouraging you to circle your calendars if you're still here in the desert, June 29th, 8.30 to 4 o'clock. Also to remind you that um, we're also having a mass, a, a mass and healing service this Wednesday night with Father um, Pat Crowley. So it's going to be a, a praise and worship starting at 6.30 and the mass at 7. So we encourage you to do that. And I think there's a 5.30 mass at 6.30, so it's going to be a quick shift. What we have handed out to you all is some... Uh, handouts. Of course, we say we said the prayer. Uh, there's a list from Father Hatch. All the different charismatic gifts is listed in Scripture. We don't have time today to go through all that. Also, an uh, article on the gift of tongue. It's really important to read that. There is a personal testimony in there from a, a college seminarian and um, a four-page personal testimony. So we want you to read that. And there is also. Another article speaking in tongues, a very good one, and it also has this man's experience of not receiving the gift, much like David said, uh, Deacon David, but then gradually did um, come to uh, experience that gift. So um, I was baptized in the Spirit in 1975, and because of that experience, my life was transformed. And I'm not going to go into the actual experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it was a very powerful experience that I had not spoken in tongues at the time, like David. What happened to me was that I went to a prayer group. Uh, someone invited me to go to this uh, conference with about 500 women. And it was along the Potomac in Virginia, near Washington, D.C. It was the most beautiful restaurant, beautiful setting. And everybody began to sing and praise God in their tongue, their own individual tongue. So the whole group was praising the Lord. And I was sitting there listening to it, and I said, oh, it sounds like angels. It was so angelic. And they were singing in tongues. So there was a harmony. There was an up and a down. And, a, you know, everybody was moving together as if there was an orchestra being led. And it was being led by the Holy Spirit. I said, oh, it's so beautiful. And so I just sat there and enjoyed it. And so on the way home from that meeting, the lady asked me, she says, would you like to have the gift of tongues? And I said, yes. I would. I said, how did you know? And she says, well, God just put it in my mind that you were ready and you wanted it. So I said, okay. So we went to her house and I sat down in a chair and I didn't know what to expect. I had not read about the gift of tongues. I didn't know about it. I just heard it. And so I sat down in this chair and she stood behind me and she never laid her hands on me either. And she says, just ask God for the gift of tongues. I said, okay, I'll ask God. So I sat there in the chair, and all of a sudden, the battle. <laughs> this is stupid. This is ridiculous. But I want it. I heard it. It was real. Oh, this is embarrassing. All that stuff. All of a sudden, by the grace of God, I'm just sitting there. I don't know what to do. I never read what to do. I don't know what to do. And the Holy Spirit, it's like an arrow right through my head. This message said, you must become as a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I said, I can do that. I can do that. I had a little baby at home, you know, a one-year-old. So I pictured myself in diapers, nothing else on but my diapers, and I pictured myself before the heavenly throne of my God, my Father. And I became a baby before him. I'm just going to start to talk to God like a baby, babbling. And the first word that came to me, God helps us. He helps us in our weakness. We don't know what to do, right? I didn't know what to do. All of a sudden, I'm just going to say, Abba. Abba, Abba, Abba. That's what I thought. I would just say, Abba. I didn't know that Abba meant my very own father, my papa, daddy. How many of you know that Abba? Jesus said, Abba, Father. I didn't know. I was new. I had just been baptized in spirit and I was devouring the scriptures and it was came alive to me you know love came to me my husband says what are you doing you know I want what you have and I said just ask God to fill you with the spirit just start reading the scriptures so he started doing that I had love for myself like I never had love before I had love for God like I ever since I was a little child I wanted to know love and serve God I remember at five years old I had this message that I heard a, a morning dove coo and um 
for some reason, I said, someday I'm going to know a lot and serve God. So anyway, um, so I said, Abba, 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 Abba. I'm sharing with you my prayer language. I'm not giving you a message in tongues like Deacon says. I hope you don't mind me sharing my language with you, my tongue. It's a prayer. And I just began, I started feeling Oriental. I started feeling Asian. I felt like my, you know, my eyes were back. I was like uh, going along a river on a, you know, what do they call that? Sandpan or something like that. Yeah. I said, oh my gosh. And I got up from the chair. I started walking and praising and worshiping and thanking and, and there was no, I was shouting. I was, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus, hallelujah. But I wasn't saying it in English. And so then I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder if I can stop. So I put my mouth, my hand to my mouth. I stopped. Well, I didn't want to lose it. I said, I wonder if I can start up again. So I started up again. Oh my gosh. So then I said, I gotta go home. I gotta go home. And uh, that was it. I went home. And ever since then, 1975, February 1975, I have prayed in tongues. And the beauty of it, like Deacon was saying, it developed. Sometimes, and I use it as an intercessory prayer. I don't know how to pray. That's what the Holy Spirit, he prays in us. We don't, we need God today. Not our will, but his will, right? It's Jesus in the agony of the garden. Lord, take this away from me, but not my will, but thine. So as I pray and intercede, I've experienced different languages. Some that sound very Hebrew. Some that sound like American Indian. Some that sound like the Oriental. Some that sound, uh, just like something I don't know. Because <coughs> a lot of people call the gift of tongues a heavenly language. It could be of the angels. We don't know. Like in, in, in the alphabet, we have 26 letters, right? And we form words. Well, some of this might be so heavenly, maybe it doesn't have vowels. You know what I'm saying? So that was my experience of praying in tongues. So right away, I have to close up because we want to do uh, a few other things. But um, I went home and my... Uh, we were in a city where I didn't have a doctor, and my little boy had, a, had five children at that time, not even three. But um, I, my son got the fever, and I didn't have a doctor. And I just laid my hands on him. For some reason, I just felt called to lay my hands on him. By then, I'd read in scriptures about healing and all the other gifts. And I laid my hands on him, and I said, uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, please take this fever away from my son. Please heal him, whatever is causing this, this illness. And as I prayed for him, he just broke out in a sweat. It was completely gone. Yes. And I said, Lord, did I do what was right? Is that okay? And he nudged me to open the scriptures, and I opened the scriptures, and the Bible fell open to Mark chapters. Is it 16? These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover and they will speak in other languages. So I said, okay, thank you. Close the Bible. That's what we're called to do. We're called to heal. We're called to help. We're called to evangelize. And we're called to love God. God poured his love into my heart so strong. And that's what, you know, I spent the last, next, all the years of my life since then helping people come to know the Lord and to come to know the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues. So with that, Deacon... What do you think our next step is? Well, I think what we should do now is we're going to have a little prayer. And what you all can remain seated if you'd like. And um, we're going to begin with a renewal of our baptismal vows. Okay, and our response will be, I do. All right. Do you reject Satan so as to live in the freedom of God's children? I do. 
Do you reject Satan, father of sin and prince of darkness? I do. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, died, was buried, rose from the dead, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? I do. This is our faith. This is the faith of the church. And we are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us with your grace and your charisms. Helping is to get to the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's Come, Holy Spirit, fill us with your grace and your charisms. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our lips to speak, our minds to comprehend, and our hearts to embrace the path that you set before us. Lord, we ask to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask for the gift of tongues to offer you praise and honor and glory. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Pray in tongues if you are so inclined. Do not be embarrassed. You're praising the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you. You have to give the Lord your voice. He doesn't make it out. No, I have to give your voice. Don't look at the intellect. Just let your heart show the other He says, <laughs> Worship with our body, our mind, and our soul, and everything, you know. But, uh, you know, the glory of God, uh, He gives us life. He says, I can't even have life and life abundantly. He's trying to wake us up, and in the gift of tongues, we begin to experience the glory of God in our lives, you know. And uh, so, what do they say? The glory of God is man fully alive by St. Arabius. St. Arabius. Okay, so over analysis, no one comprehends what's God's truly except the Spirit of God. So sometimes we overanalyze it and try to, you know, I find like a lot of engineer types are really difficult to break through, you know, that they have to really let go because they have all the analytical things working on and that's their gift. So they, sometimes they have to break through that analytical mind. And it's kind of like Peter. Remember when Peter was walking on the water and he just got up, I want, bid me, come to you, Lord. And so the Lord called him. So Peter just 
some. Now, if I'd have had a bicep, there's no way I would have started walking on water, right? Because if you go in the water, you, you, you go down, right? So you don't walk on water. But Peter let go of his analytical. All he knew about being in the ocean and the, 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 you know, the waters. And he got out. And he walked. It wasn't until he got his mind off of what he was doing and looked up, oh, and he started to sink, right? So it is kind of like that with getting into the spirit. It's like, don't try to analyze it. Don't try to figure it out. Just look to God and ask him to help you. The other one is that they, expecting God to yank your tongue out, you know, <laughs> make it move, you know, or make your voice come out. I was on a Curcio one time, and I was in the, how many have been on Curcio? Praise the Lord, okay? Yeah. That's where my spiritual rule started, you know, God led me to a Curcio. I was in the chapel praying, and I felt a, a, something from within me coming up. I said, oh my gosh, if I open up my mouth, something's going to come out. <laughs> so I, I put my hand over my mouth. I didn't know what it was. So I, that was in 1972. It took me three years before I really experienced what it was. That was the Holy Spirit trying to release himself. We all have the gifts in us already through our baptism, right? Yes. The Holy Spirit came upon us in our baptism. The gifts are there. They're sealed in confirmation. They're ours. Now we just have to start releasing them. Whether it's you know, evangelization, teaching, administration, healing, miracles, you know, raising the dead. I have never seen someone raised from the dead except my little baby fish. <laughs> <laughs> and it flipped over backwards, and I had put it in the toilet, ready to flush it, and then thought, I said, wait a minute, I wonder what would happen. I put it in my, I got out of that toilet. I put my hand over it and I prayed and that little fish came back to life. <laughs> That's the result of that. Don't try to figure it out. The only person I've raised to death is the only right, from the dead. But we hear about it happening all over the world. And um, anyway, so over analysis, pride and prejudice, sometimes we're taught the gift is not for today. That's a very popular teaching. That was just 2,000 years ago when Jesus started the church. So that, you know, prejudice that we get from other people, or it means you're a holy roller, you're going to start rolling on the floor or something. No, 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 no. Thank God we have this gift in our church. We have the magisterium helping us work and move in the gifts of the Spirit properly. So if we have a problem, we go to the teaching church, and it's right there in the catechism. It's right there in our bishops. It's all of them guiding us. And that's why the Holy Fathers have just loved this outpouring. It's the hope of the church that the Spirit is still with us, right? Yes. Despite the problems, and that's why the Spirit is here. We have a lot of problems. So don't you think it's right that God would say, I'm going to help my people. I am going to pour out my Spirit so that we all don't go down the drain. Another is fear. Fear of what God is going to ask me to do. I have a brother who was a seminarian, who is a wonderful person, who just has a beautiful family, but he is afraid. He is afraid. He says, Donna, I'm afraid of what God will ask me to do if I open up to him. He won't even pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He sees everybody, my mom, my dad, my brothers, family. All of us have been baptized in the Spirit, but he won't. He said, and I think because he's got a real calling. And he says, I am afraid of what God will ask me to do. So fear can keep us. But we have a loving God. He is not going to do anything to us. He is not going to harm us. But what he allows us to do, right? So fear is an obstacle. Um, in action, we already said that. Don't, don't just stand there and wait. Uh, give God your voice. Be willing to be foolish for Christ. Be willing to start out with a little baby sound. Uh, and then let God scoop it up and take it. So that is all I'm going to share about those obstacles. Those are just kind of some of the things that I've seen through the many years of praying with people for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now what we wanted to do is um, questions, right? We wanted a question and answer here. We passed out a little um, paper. If anybody have a question that you want to send them for. I just wanted to make a comment about your speaking. Um, I'm a member of a 12-step program, and fear is false evidence appearing real. Amen. And, and Amen. when you see that, you go, oh, yeah, well, that's just holding me back. Yeah. That's right, fear. Amen. Fear keeps us apart. In fact, even sometimes through my journey, sometimes I've gotten too busy with church work and lost my first love. You know, that's a uh, something that can happen to us in the 
message of the churches in the book of Revelation, he says, you've lost your first love. Your first love is me. We get so busy doing stuff. And always that God gives that song to me, don't let fear keep us apart. Come back to me. Come back to me. And that's when I call back to get back to sitting down and reading the scripture and just praising him in tongues. And, you know, all this other stuff will get done. But if we put God aside to start another meeting or to go someplace else or go to another uh, symposium, and we're avoiding our relationship with God, something, you know, he'll call us back. Any other, did anybody get questions? Or is it, there's a question probably. Anybody else have a question? But I sure want to encourage you to come to this day of renewal with uh, uh, Deacon Steve Drago, please, and I'm sure you'll be part of that too. You know, let's. You know, we could not be here really without Deacon Dave. He is our spiritual director. We go to him. He he corrects us and he helps us. He participates in the events and he is a dream. Let's give him another. Yeah. Okay, this question is for you, Donna. What did Donna experience with the Holy Spirit and healing? What did I experience? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I was amazed. Isn't that a word they use in Scripture? When Jesus did things, they were all amazed. I was amazed. I came up and just laid hands on my little child. Lord, please take away this fear. And since then, many, 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 many healings. Many healings. One day, just uh, just a word on healing. I had rheumatoid arthritis. It was horrible. It was crippling. I was on crutches. I had everybody in the prayer groups praying for me and everything. So one day, uh, night, I was in a lot of pain, and I got up in the middle of the night and I said, "Lord, thank you, thank you for this pain. Otherwise, I'd be asleep right now." And as I thanked Him, the Holy Spirit came up on me like. I would always think of like Tinkerbell, a little dust of Tinkerbell. Just like that. Gone. Yes. It's not it's even good. in my blood anymore. It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. 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 Question in the back. Um, no, I, it's not a testimony. I just want to say, you know, how did I get the, you know, the lit gift of tongues? Uh, I was in the life of the spirit, and um, Donna was next to me. And... Um, I had been reading the Bible and getting closer to God, and the God says, you know, the gift of tongues is, you know, is the language, the closest you can get to God. And when I read that, I thought, gosh, this is the closest I can get to God. That's awesome. So Donna was next to me, and she says, to, would you like to have the gift of tongues? And I looked at her, and I thought, this is the closest I can get to God. And I was battling cancer at the time. And I turn to Donna and I says yes. And she says, this is the only thing you have to do. Of which she says, become a child. And I start just saying, blah, 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 blah. And we were all gathering in the room, you know, speaking of tongues. And just, like, exactly what she says, demonstrate, just came out and I started speaking in tongues. And when I went home, you know, if I didn't make an accident, it was because, you know, <laughs> the spirit was with me, but I drove up and and I just, you know, I just was overwhelmed because the gift has been given to me, <coughs> not knowing the God too much, so it felt special. It's not that I'm trying to convince everybody, it's just I wanted to reconfirm how I got my gift of tongues. Well, thank you, Jeanette. And we can confirm her story in um, Madeline's prayer group. Yes. Okay. Because we prayed. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, may, may I say something? It seems like the Lord wants me to share. Okay. And, and the reason I want to share this is because of what you said, Deacon Dave. I, I have been a charismatic person in the movement for a long time through prayer group and all that. But I always felt I didn't need tongues. <laughs> And everyone would pray over me and I would get really upset because I'd say, why do they have to be you? But one time I went to a Life in the Spirit, as a matter of fact, we were putting it on, and we had this priest visiting us, and he talked about how, you know, the gift of tongues. 
And he said, it's a gift that everyone can have if they want it. Right. It's just surrendering your tongue, the last part of you. And he told a story that really impressed me. He said he was in Canada giving a, a seminar, and he was praying over people in tongues. And there was this lady, she, apparently she was German, and she was sitting in the back uh, like this. <laughs> and he said every time he was praying, he would look over there, and he would just pray in tongues, you know. He continued praying. At the end of the, 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 the meeting, she came up to me and said, him and said, I didn't know you speak German. He, she, he said, I don't. And she said, you said something to me in German that only God knows. <laughs> so, and he said, well, maybe God wants you to know this is real. <laughs> and of course, she, she prayed, they prayed over himself. And the same thing happened to me that night. I thought, OK, Lord, I want this gift. I want it, Lord. I, I surrender to you. And he prayed over me, nothing happened, but I was driving home, and I opened my mouth, and all of these sounds were coming out of me. And it scared me to death, because it sounded like Italian, and Chinese, and Japanese, and I'm going, that doesn't sound like it, Lord. Anyway, the next, I said, if this is from you, Lord, I really want it. The next day, I was alone at home, it was my day off, and I started praying, and I received the gift, and it was the best thing that has happened to me. It was like going to a psychiatrist and God healed me. Yes. I didn't even know that I needed healing. Amen. 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 I close in that which uh, Madeline reminded me. My brother smoked. Yeah. One of my brothers smoked, smoked, my six brothers. So he smoked, smoked, smoked. He was at a charismatic conference and he began to lead the people singing in tongues and, and going to communion. In the, in the presence of the Lord, in communion and singing and praising in tongues, the smoking went away. Wow. It just wow. totally went away. He never needed another cigarette the rest of his life. And that has happened to Julie, too. You know? So there are miracles that happen, like you mentioned. Yep. The miracles that happen when yep. groups of people get together and Amen. forget about themselves and just focus on God and praise Him. Hallelujah. That's it. I would just like to say the thoughts by both of you have been fantastic. It has been a whole renewal for me. Thank you, Jesus. I've been here for years. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1974. So I've been here for years. But this has been a total renewal just being here. I haven't been using the gift as much as I could be. And I think that's going to help me tonight. Praise the Lord. That's what we pray for, that this is a renewal for us. The Lord be with you. And with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a blessed day. Thank you for coming.